Okay, good afternoon. First of all, you might wonder why a Finnish lady is talking about this project along the Mekong River. So I'll explain to you why before I start my presentation. So I used to work with the Dutch development organization with, when the project uh, was actually commenced uh, in 2006. So I was in Cambodia, I was heading the office um, or the portfolio of Cambodia for three and a half years and responsible for the tourism sector side of it. And we started uh, this project. So I've uh, I would say that uh, th with three and a half years experience then, and then some information and follow up uh, from the continuing organizations uh, um, actually implementing the project. Uh, so I'm following this up, uh, even though I'm no longer in Cambodia. So why Mekong Discovery Trail Project? Uh, well. Cambodia is a small country in Southeast Asia and its tourism, I would say, is still very heavily dependent on the World Heritage Site, the Angkor Wat. So the ministry created at that time a strategy to diversify its tourism product and also trying and aiming at diversifying the, or the redistributing the income generation activities from tourism to the other regions other than the Siem Reap and its surroundings. So they created this policy that uh, the Siem Reap area here marked uh, with the number one would be more or less uh, for cultural tourism. The uh, number two, the Bon Pen, uh, the capital city and its surroundings for business and city tourism. Then the coastal area, basically, for coastal tourism. And the fourth one, the northeast Cambodia, for nature-based tourism. So this was uh, the ministry's policy. Well, we did a survey among the private sector and ask their views and opinions about ecotourism in Cambodia and its potential. So the private sector basically agreed that Northeast Cambodia would have the highest potential for nature-based tourism. So that's why the ministry, together with the World Tourism Organization, and SNV, we started uh, this Mekong Discovery Trail project. Where the objectives are basically based on the three P's, people, planet, and profit. And here on this map, uh, this highlights the situation about poverty and the natural resources in Cambodia. So the darker the yellow, the poorer the region. So here you can see that Northeast Cambodia is quite a poor region within the country. Actually, along the Mekong Trail in Stung Tren, around 50% of the households were living under one US dollar a day in 2006. While in Krache, it was 30% of the households at that time. But uh, as an anecdote, I would also like to draw your attention to the Siem Reap region. Even though Angkor Wat is the jewel of Cambodia's tourism industry, the province is also one of the poorest provinces, the Siem Reap province. So they have not been able to trigger down the tourism income to the locals, to the poorest of the poor in the country. So this is the controversial, and I can have plenty of discussions of why this is the situation around Siam Red. But 
with the Mekong Discovery Trail, the attempt and aim was really to assist the northeastern part of the country. And the concept of this Mekong Discovery Trail basically follows the idea of uh, heritage trails, more or less. Why it was attractive was that this area already draw attention from the international markets because a lot of international tourists to Cambodia, they don't only come for Cambodia, but they travel around Southeast Asia. So they combined Laos and Cambodia, or Thailand and Cambodia, and then upwards to Laos. So this, uh, this area was, was basically along their travel route in, in Cambodia. And then it had uh, connections to the neighboring countries. But before I go any further, and if you allow me a couple of minutes for technical purposes, I would like to show a short video so you would be emerged to the Mekong region itself. Perhaps I'll continue with the presentation while they are trying to solve the <laughs> techniques. Mm -hmm. So if you can put it back. So we can try to show the video afterwards. Uh, but uh, it's a real pity because I wanted you to uh, experience uh, the Mekong River and the Discovery Trail before I, I go further. But uh, first, uh, we were basically in this project document, we were using the Millennium Development Goals. And one of the reasons why those were used in the project document was that the funders <laughs> were coming from that approach. And uh, there the aim was employment uh, of the poor. So targeting the uh, poverty alleviation here. So the interventions aimed at uh, increasing the visitor numbers <coughs> and extending the length of stay. Why is this? Because based on the study that we conducted uh, with IFC, it showed that uh, the accommodation sector <coughs> had the highest impact on the poor. <coughs> it employed basically 83% 83, 83 of the employees in the accommodation sector in this region were coming from the poor or near poor households or families. So the idea was that we have to extend the length of stay from one night to two nights at least. And how we were aiming at doing it was to pro provide enough reason to stay longer in the region. So we created uh, different types of trails in the areas. So the capital, provincial capital cities, they were acting as the, I would say, service points or gateways to the region. And then the tourists, based on their own interest, time available and the budget available could choose whether they want to take all the possible trails or only a couple of them. So they had the option to stay longer or to stay a shorter period of time but still experience the local way of life and see the areas. So we assisted uh, the provincial tourism authorities and the communities to improve the interpretation along these trails and also the trail design. We created different types of experiences. So what you could do is to take a horse cart to bicycle, then you could stay overnight in a vat. So basically this Buddhist uh, but uh, then 
we had the viewing points for the Mekong River, not okay. only the dolphins. So the whole idea behind this project was that the dolphin is basically the key attraction to attract the people to come there. But since they are endangered species, we did not want to focus solely on the dolphins. Because visitors, when they came to the region, they spent only half an hour or one hour watching the dolphins. So then what? Huh? So we provided uh, these different type of uh, activities. <laughs> then supplying the goods and services. So we organized training for the local, selected local communities because not all the communities could become a sort of tourist attractions in the area. But there was a selection of uh, seven to nine communities along the river where you actually, we gave them English language training because as uh, it was uh, stated uh, earlier today, that language is one of the barriers in community-based tourism. So English language training for focal points who could then act with the private sector, for example, and booking the tours and so forth. But we also developed uh, to help the local communities, those who were running homestays, restaurants, uh, and so forth, with uh, the non-verbal communication tool. And here we have a couple of examples. So these homestay places, the owners had these cards for their international visitors to use so that there was at least some type of communication to fulfill some of the needs. Uh, okay, in this case, that would be more from the visitor's point of view. But uh, this was a very helpful tool to engage the locals in running their businesses. Then direct sales to visitors by the poor. So here we can see a couple of uh, very important uh, produce from the region. The first one, which is in the Bamboo shoot is called kralan, which is filled with rice, which is cooked in a coconut cream or milk, and then they add some beans and mix beans with it. So a very heavy calorie intake. And this is something actually that the Khmer Rouge and the soldiers were carrying on, on their backs during the war times in Cambodia to get, give them enough energy. But it's a very delicious product and it takes overnight to produce it for the next day morning. And then the second one is Nam, which um, in, within the leaf you have some mashed sour fish in it. So these, uh, these were quite popular especially among the domestic uh, visitors. But with the internationals, they found the kralan very delicious, but then they were also concerned about the hygiene conditions uh, of, uh, of this produce. Then uh, we also worked uh, with the horse cart drivers, uh, so that uh, from the guest houses, people could order a Kratze city tour with the horse carts. This, this is just uh, one example on direct sales. But there were challenges, especially with the horse cart owners, because based on the history of Cambodia, collaboration was not a very common thing. And this is really related to their history. So there was, when we started this project, there was a lot of mistrust 
between the public authorities and the other stakeholders, between NGOs and private sector and all that. So it took us a couple of, uh, I would say two, three years, for example, before we could get the NGOs to work together with the private sector, that they both need each other. But uh, so this is the background that we have to remember in Cambodia. And then the establishment of enterprises, uh, this uh, is very challenging. Uh, when you think of the capacity of, uh, of the local people, so a lot of them were not uh, entrepreneurs in, in their mindset. And again, we can explain partly that uh, because of the, of the history. But then uh, we had very good examples who encouraged the other people to consider setting up their own enterprises. So, for example, close to the Krache capital, provincial capital, we had an island just across it, and there we had homestay providers and people who were renting bicycles for, for the tourists. Those were very good examples. And then also think about old products to new markets. So the flip-flops here, that then they could try to sell to the hotels and, and guest houses. So that was one part of it. Then since this region was basically full of various types of NGOs, a couple of them considered the voluntourism in, in the region. And some of the NGOs were also trained by, by the program for tourism related issues and tourism development related issues. And another example that I want to mention here is the so-called Big Brother program. In many places, Big Brother has a negative connotation, but in this case, this was rather positive. This was an initiative proposed by the general manager of Intercontinental Hotel in Phnom Penh. He had done this in Indonesia earlier, and then he proposed it in Cambodia. And since he had a lot of influence in the Cambodian Hotel Association, he was able to kickstart it. And the Big Brother program was such that uh, basically the bigger hotel chains located in, in the capital city, they provided uh, some mentoring and some advice to the provincial hotel owners how to make the hotel business more effective in the provincial areas. And what was in, in it for the Intercontinental Hotel, for example? Because if you travel to the faraway provinces, it also means that those tourists would need to more or less, would need to come back to Phnom Penh so that they would gain an extra night stay in their own hotel again. So they also promoted uh, this, uh, this region and this uh, tourism destination. So now, huh? very briefly, of course we have five minutes. I think this might take a little bit longer than uh, five minutes, but... Uh, Flowing from the Tibetan Plateau South, through China, Burma, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia and finally into the South China Sea in Vietnam. The journey is timeless. Bold and brown, the Mekong touches on the lives daily of over 70 million people. 
and has sustained the families of Southeast Asia since time immemorial. It is a river so rich in biodiversity that in the last decade over a thousand new species have been discovered and classified by researchers and academics. The Mekong, an immense river, melted to the earth over 4,000 kilometers, ranks in the top three for biodiversity alongside the Amazon and the Congo, with over 1,200 known species of fish alone. The freshwater dolphin is our flagship icon in a new and daring initiative to promote and sustain the livelihoods of 104 villages, over 70,000 people, along the banks of the Mekong River in Cambodia. In northeast Cambodia, our river's health and vitality serves and sustains us, the Khmer people. We rely on it for our daily needs. Who knows what you will discover in the sound and in the light. We offer you rare and reclusive river life adventures. Welcome to the Mekong Discovery Trail. With over 200 kilometers of cycle tracks, river boat journeys, and some of Cambodia's finest cuisine to savor, you can enjoy all these activities on some of the best river beaches and under truly extraordinary sunsets. It is Cambodia, like you've never seen it or experienced it before. Naturally. With two remarkable biodiversity hotspots along the trail, the inundated forest just north of the port of Song Tren and the river islands north of Krache. Not only will you get the chance to see the beautiful dolphins in their natural habitat, but also to meet the many communities along the trail. It's where we invite you to relax, unwind, refresh, and enrich all your senses. Priceless. From the river ports of Krat and Stung Trang, you can access the Mekong Discovery Trail for day trips, or extend your stay overnight with a homestay in almost any of the riparian village communities. We encourage you to explore the trail at your own pace, and to leave nothing behind but footprints in the sand. We welcome you to stay a little longer, smile a little wider, and you'll come away with much more than you bargained for. Trek, canoe or cycle. Whatever you do, take your time. There will always be someone to help you on your way. A variety of accommodations allow you to experience the spiritual life of the river, with pagoda stays at magnificent watts. Cruise and Mekong on houseboats, as well as enjoying traditional village life with homesteads at numerous locations along the trail. Mix and match your overnight stays in any combination. It's even possible to do it by bamboo raft. Whatever voyage you decide on, the idea of taking the tube will never be the same again. Respecting our culture and traditions, as well as the environment in Cambodia, are the cornerstones of the Mekong Discovery Trail. You can help ensure that things stay the same by supporting the conservation efforts to save the critically endangered freshwater dolphins. Managed and embraced by us, the local communities, you can combine any number of activities in any order, on any day of the week, knowing that your safety and security, as well as your comfort, it's part of the spirit of the trail. It's not fly drive. It's high drive, low impact, ethical ecotourism. The Mekong Discovery Trail. It's a treasure. What will you make of it? So, because of the time limitation, I would like to end up, so this was not only 
roses, I would say, <laughs> developing this uh, project. So we had a lot of challenges and one of them was, I would say, the power struggle or the power game huh? with, uh, with all the stakeholders in, involved. Huh? And um, also the, uh, one of the most challenging things was the lack of land use planning for, for various purposes because you had mining industry, you had the military, you had the Ministry of Environment and uh, what not involved. So there were, there were a lot of conflicting views and aspects uh, how to best uh, use uh, the resources uh, in, in the region. But then one of the key elements that I would like to highlight here was the private sector's participation and feedback in developing the trails and, and the marketing material in it. So, thank you and I hope you enjoyed your trip to Mekong Discovery Trail, even though with some technical challenges, but that also reflects uh, that it's not a perfect destination, so everyone who visits that re region should be aware of of the challenges also ahead. So it's a discovery not only to the region, it might be a discovery to the visitor, him or herself, and discovery to the new cultural traditions. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria. And um, now we do have time for a uh, few questions. Who wants to start? Are you speechless? Do <laughs> <laughs> you have evidence how was the later when you designed the project, developed the project? Do you have any evidence how this was uh, embraced by market? How, what was the, the, the response of the market? Well, I didn't want to take all these statistics in, but I would say that the number of international arrivals doubled from 2006-07 to 2011. So if we roughly would say that in 2006 it was around 110, 120,000. In 2011, it was more than 200,000. So it more than doubled. Then the length of stay, as uh, it was actually better than we expected. Uh, so from average one night to 2.5 uh, nights in the region. Now, earlier this morning, I raised that issue about the indicators. So in 2006, we did a very extensive baseline study so that we would be able to satisfy our funding organizations that, uh, so how, what is the impact of, of the project. Unfortunately, now in 2011, I know that they have conducted a sample survey in a couple of the places but I could not get hold of, of those reports for, for this conference. But that is one of the challenges for this type of development projects, as I mentioned earlier today, the, the indicators, how to get the simple and relevant indicators that would be easy to, to collect, because the exercise that we did in 2006, it took us almost like one and a half years collect uh, the necessary information and that is far too long time it takes. Uh, I'm asking because also we have the, the same challenge, you know, yeah. everybody is asking about the measurable, yeah. you know, things. And, but I also want to stress that uh, in our case this is bordering region, you see, and uh, if we keep young generation on the farm, yeah. uh, which uh, area is already uh, depopulated, where people are, you know, Aging, uh, I think it's also a, a kind of kind of result and achievement. 
maybe not just because of this project, but because of the opportunities which are then attached to such things. And well, sometimes some things are not simply not uh, uh, could not be measured. Measured. This is also my opinion. But important yeah, yeah. to be to be aware of. But I mentioned the accommodation sector that uh, the employees there were more or less from the poor or near poor backgrounds. But uh, I think it is a universal phenomena that once they stay long enough in a hotel in a provincial region, they get the their, they improve their capacity. They will move away to the capital city yeah, with better salaries. And so forth. So this is also a challenge uh, to these provincial prefectures. We mentioned earlier today, this morning, about um, who it is that gets involved um, and how much money stays in the area. In, in, in your project, what steps did you take to try and ensure that local, so-called indigenous people, um, and what was the role of, well, yourself as an outsider yeah, yeah. and your Dutch colleagues? Yeah. And we talked at lunch now about leaving um, resources and leaving knowledge and improvements. So, basically the Dutch organization is connected, uh, was connected to the Ministry of Tourism. So, we, our mandate was to give advisory services to the ministry. So from the Cambodian side, the, at the national level, it was the Ministry of Tourism. And then at the provincial level, the tourism authority is there. But then we also involved the NGOs, and they were given training about tourism, because they were NGOs on, basically, they were more targeting on protecting the nature than, and than the tourism background. So you have to give them a little bit of training also from the tourism perspective. Because they were working hand in hand with the local communities. In this video, you also saw that local lady discussing with the local community. So this is how we also take into account uh, the views and opinions of uh, of the selected communities in, in the region. So there, there, there was quite an extensive uh, sort of communication uh, with, the, with the communities in there. But uh, I could discuss the challenges uh, during the coffee breaks because as I mentioned earlier, the power struggle was also a very heavy and challenging issue between the different ministries uh, between the private sector and, and so forth. Or so. well, within the private sector? Within, but also between the private sector and the public sector. Thank you, Anna Maria. Thank you.